What's up, hobby friends? My name is Casey, and welcome to another Miniature Rescue. Today, we're gonna rescue an absolute Greek legend of a model, Marathi, the not Medusa of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. This video has been sponsored by Manscaped.com, but more on that in a little bit. Greek mythology has always had its grips on me. It probably has something to do with growing up watching movies like Clash of the Titans and Jason and the Argonauts or playing games like God of War, absolute staples of pop culture and gaming that were at the forefront of my mind since I was old enough to pick up a controller or watch a movie. And I was absolutely amazed at the way that the creatures were brought to life on the screen. Like, skeletons are supposed to look and move like this. It's just what they do. And honestly, nothing can change my mind at this point. That brings us to this week's model. Marathi is such a good model, and the army that accompanies her is equally as impressive. I picked up Marathi and her tiny counterpart on eBay at a pretty good price, around a hundred bucks, which is quite a bit less than the MSRP of 150 from the GW store. It's not the best savings I've got, but enough to push me over the edge and pick up this incredible model. And on top of that, the paint that's on the model looks primarily like contrast paint, so the layers aren't super thick and something that doesn't necessarily need to be stripped off. That's definitely something to keep in mind when you're buying used models. How much time will you need to spend in order to actually make a project work? More often than not, I buy things that are in, shall we say, a state. And those projects do need quite a bit of attention before they can be played on the tabletop. But every so often I come across models that have been half started, something that someone absolutely intended on spending time on and painting up right, but they just didn't get to it. There's always an opportunity to get models like this and just continue that work. That saves a ton of time and money because you don't have to assemble or prime the model. And I do love it when I get a model in the mail that I can just work on almost immediately. One thing in particular that I love about Warhammer is that there's quite a bit of history in the designs. I'm not talking about historical influences. I mean that there are some models in the Games Workshop lineup that have gone through several iterations since their inception. Old models, even from the late 80s, have been redesigned over the last 30 plus years and we've gotten to see how they change and grow with the hobby. Take a look at the original Gaskell model from the Orc lineup. It's great and it's old. Then there was another and yet another, each being improved upon with new techniques and technology. It's something I really appreciate because when I buy a model that has that history, it allows me to explore that history and add something to my list of things to collect if I don't have all of those models. And Marathi is no exception. There are several different versions of this model that have come out since the 90s, and each one of them is special in its own way. Last year when I went to Adepticon, a massive tabletop gaming convention in Chicago, I was fortunate enough to meet and talk to the original sculptor of the first iteration of Marathi. Chris Fitzpatrick worked for Games Workshop in the late 90s and designed the Dark Elves army for Warhammer Fantasy. It was really awesome to hear what that was like and talk about this model specifically. I really like this model. It has so much character and such a specific aesthetic. It was designed by hand and the details were thought out and planned for painting. It's just one of those models that you just don't see anymore. And because I bought the new one, this one landed on my desk at the same time, simply because it exists within the history of that model. I wanted to own all of it. Like you can totally see how this model became the new one. The designers looked at this old model and made sure that there were things brought over to pay homage and update something that people were familiar with, and I love that. The pose is similar, the spear she has is similar, and even the hand pointing or beckoning is still in the sculpt. It's honestly just really cool to see how things change from year to year through the models that have come out. And while Chris Fitzpatrick hasn't worked at GW since the early 2000s, he's still making models and games. Maybe, unironically, there are more than a few models in his game War Gods of Olympus that take inspiration from the exact same place as Marathi. It's all Greek, and it's very, very cool. And it's hand sculpted like the models from those early days, so everything has a very unique look to it that you just don't see a ton of anymore. I put links in the description, and I highly recommend checking out Crocodile Games if you want to see some really cool minis. When I buy models like this on eBay, it's not necessarily my intention to start a new army with them, but something about the style and theme of this particular army is really making me want to do something about that. It's all well and good to see one giant snake lady on the table, but what about a hundred of them? 
It also happens that Alice from Ataraxia Painting, who sent me a pretty large box of minis, including the newest version of Gazgul, check that out right here, also included a couple of sprues of Daughters of Cain in that box. So my excuses not to build an entire Age of Sigmar army are really running out. I practically have 2,000 points right here. Well, not even close to it, but it's more than a good start. So of course I decided to buy into the army and I'm waiting eagerly for my massive box of minis to come in the mail. That means at some point we're going to get to that and the other versions of Marathi. But for today, let's take a look at the Queen of Shadows herself and see what we can do. Before we continue, let me tell you about today's excellent sponsor, Manscaped. Christmas came early this year because I got gifted the new Perfect Package 4.0 by Manscaped. Let's check it out. Manscaped created the world's first all-in-one men's grooming kit that has you covered from head to toe, literally. The Lawnmower 4.0 Waterproof Cordless Trimmer is built with advanced skin safe technology, which helps reduce nicks and cuts on your most sensitive areas. It has this cool LED light, which is really helpful for grooming on those cold dark winter nights. Ooh, LED. Look how good it is at cutting the grass next to this snake. Not even a little cut. Here's a stocking stuffer for you, Crop Preserver. Ball deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. Not only does this smell good, but look how well it preserves this crop. This grass is gonna be preserved for a long time. Honestly, every guy out there needs to add Manscaped to their wish list this season. And if you've got a special guy in your life that's been extra good this year, make sure you get him the perfect package by Manscaped. For a limited time, you'll also get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. They're actually quite comfy. Now that's a gift on top of a gift, which pretty much makes you the best gift giver of all time. Yeah, don't wait. Go to manscaped.com and use promo code EMR20 to get 20% off plus free international shipping and those two free gifts. Thanks again, Manscaped, for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to that giant snake. Like I said earlier, the model isn't in terrible shape. It's well built and the paint on it is more than likely contrast, so it's rather thin. I'm gonna go over it with a light coat of black primer to start off and begin to sketch in the highlights with my airbrush. Now this is actually where I made a pretty terrible mistake. I've had this model sitting around for the last year or so, mostly uncovered on my desk, and that means that there's gonna have been some amount of dust that's collected on top of the model. In hindsight, I should have given this model a bath, regardless of how the paint looked. I was getting ahead of myself and a little too excited to start painting, that it didn't even occur to me that dust on the model would cause an issue down the road, you know, once we build up those paint layers. Using a primer over this unclean mini while covering the thin layers of paint without any issue locks in texture from dust that won't be seen until more paint gets applied. The black primer hides everything, so I just didn't notice. And I won't notice for quite some time in this video, but I felt I needed to mention it here so you would understand what it is you're seeing later on. Now, it's not the worst thing. It's just not great, and I'm annoyed that it happened. Just learn from my mistake and make sure that if you buy used models, at least run it under some water and give it a quick scrub before applying new paint. So the sketching layer goes down with no issues. The wings in particular, I spent time on to really get that gradient going. Something you can also do with a dry brush pretty easily. The sketch is specifically for using transparent paints on. We're gonna pick up that black to white color and tint the paint. Now I love doing this for wings in particular because you get those details to stand out without having to paint every single thing in by hand. And the gradients just look really cool, so it works. I decided on a 50-50 mix of green and blue transparent paint for the snake parts of the model. The wings and scales will get a nice teal color, and I feel like this stands out really well on the table and gives us some nice contrast. This also feels very Greek to me. The teal of the Mediterranean especially comes to mind, and that also brings in other opportunities to add in more color from a similar reference point like these. The rest of the skin on the upper and lower half of the body is going to be a kind of pale flesh tone. I'm gonna to start with a darker pink tone and then go over it from above with some pale flesh. And I'll do the same for the lower half of the model on these soft, snaky parts. The goal is to get a nice blend between the flesh tone and the teal. So I go a little more saturated in the middle of each piece and just lightly feather the edges together. In some areas, there is still white ink showing, but the plan is to introduce a wash to pull those areas together, tint the rest of the white, and make it make more sense. 
For the metallic portions of this model, I am going with a nice bright gold. Gold has always been important in Greek mythology, and it represents the eternal, unending, and incorruptible embracing powers of the divine. Even Jason the Argonauts set out looking for the Golden Fleece because of what it represented, the right to be the king. Hail to the king, baby. And of course, I like the way it looks and I didn't want to make it silver, or something. For the draped cloth she's wearing, I'm gonna go with that contrasting color of red. I'm gonna start out with more of a magenta and work my way up with brighter and brighter colors. It was at this point that I really started to notice the texture of the dust underneath the layers of paint. It was particularly noticeable in the cloth on the model. And yeah, it was killing me, but I decided to use it to my advantage and create even more texture with the paint. After getting the base coats on, I started the highlighting process by stippling on the brighter colors. Anywhere there was actual texture got multiple layers of stippling to essentially create a more cloth textured look using paint. I continued this all the way up to orange and really made sure to create broken up lines and stippling to make it look more like cloth. The great thing is that this actually turned out to look a lot like cloth and the crappy dust texture underneath it kinda adds to the whole look of it. It's not ideal, of course, but I'm gonna make it work as best I can without having to completely strip this model and start over. Now that we pretty much have our base layers taken care of, it's time to start bringing out more details. I'm gonna start with washing all of the gold with a 50-50 mix of Reichland Flesh Shade Gloss and Regular. The half and half mix is great because the gloss medium, which is usually a little too shiny, can give the regular wash a little bit of help in the surface tension department while still maintaining a good finish. I like to use it over gold generally, but it also works better than the regular flesh wash over faces. Speaking of the face, I'm not actually gonna use this wash on her, even though it would work pretty well. I've just come to the conclusion over the last year or so that I just prefer painting the details in on faces. I get more control and I can decide exactly how I want the color to go down. Washes are still great as a starting point and if you're trying to get stuff done quick, but they can cause a loss of detail and make the face look kind of smushy, smooth. Check out my video on painting faces right here. So the first step will be to bring in some reddish purple for the shadows. Mix down very thin into a glaze, I'll start adding color into the cheeks, around the helmet, and into the eyes. She's got very defined features, so I wanna make sure to get good shadow on her before we sharpen those features even more with highlights. I'll also use the same mix of paint on the rest of the skin, placing the color in between everything to really define the shapes of the muscles. Now that we have those shadows blocked in, I'll bring back that pale flesh tone and begin to paint in those shapes. Keeping the paint thin and doing multiple passes will help blend the shadows into the face as well. It takes more time, but I always come away much happier, and I feel like the face just looks better than what I could get just using a wash and a highlight. The final feature on her face that I want to stand out will be her eyes. Generally, I try and avoid painting eyes unless they're pretty large, and these honestly wouldn't be too bad. They're not too hard to reach, and as long as you have a nice sharp tip on the brush, you could probably get pretty good looking eyes here. But for this model, I am going to continue drawing inspiration from ancient Greece and its mythology, or at least whatever Clash of the Titans has taught me over the years. Speaking of which, in Clash of the Titans, during one of the best scenes in the movie, the heroes fight Medusa, and when she goes to turn someone into stone, her eyes light up a very bright green when she makes eye contact with her victim. So I'm gonna be using some bright green for Marathi. It's not huge, but when I see her face, it definitely reminds me of that movie and what I think of when I think of Medusa. The scales on this model already look pretty good, but I wanna brighten up and define the texture a bit more, so I'll be employing a very light dry brush of bright teal. This will go all over the top of the snakes as well as the scales and really bring that detail out. To help blend our airbrush layers together and bring in a little more color, I'll be using an oil wash of purple across the skin on the lower half and all of the teal, including the wings. The purple really gives a nice shadow and brings out all of the details in the skin. And of course, any excess wash that collects on any flat surfaces where I painted in highlights can simply be wiped away with a makeup sponge. And that should keep everything looking pretty clean. And finally, as a finishing touch to the snake portion of the model, I bring in a little bit of that bright green into the stinger on the tail. Just a light coating to blend near the top and an opaque layer right at the sharpest point of the tail. The base on Marathi is really cool. It's pre-sculpted with a bunch of broken up stonework, and there's even a little guy on there that's been turned into stone, really cementing the fact that this is in fact a model of Medusa. 
I'm once again taking inspiration from the Greek coastal line and going with a grass and rock mixture. I picked out some dry grass and fairly bright greens as well as some red stones to mix in. I'll start by painting in the base with a purple brown. Not that the color really matters, but it helps hide anything we miss while being still kind of a dirt color. And the purple is playing into the shadow color on the model. It, it works. After that goes down, I'll be using an old brush to spread out some PVA all over the base. Now that we have some glue, I can bring in a variety of grass tufts to give the environment some variety in texture and color. A few darker tufts, some tufts with little yellow flowers, and some regular old green ones. Then I'll use my jar of dirt to spread little patches of mixed red sand and rocks. This acts as bits of rubble and helps break up the grassy areas, and it works really well with the colors we have across the base and the model. Lastly, I use some yellow and bright green grass to create patches across the entire base. Mixing up your grasses and materials really helps sell the look of the base. If everything is a uniform color and size, then it just stands out too much and looks fake. So when it comes to grass, more and different generally works best. Besides the pretty stupid mistake of not cleaning off this model before I started painting it, this has been one of my favorite models to paint in a long time. The rich history of the model from the original to its new incarnation and literal history and look of Greece have really made this model something more than a piece of plastic. I really did buy the rest of this army and absolutely plan on building it up. And now that I have a good color scheme in mind, I think it's gonna be a really great project. Marathi was pretty much a proof of concept here. I wasn't sure I was going to like painting this model. I mean, I was probably gonna like it, but you never know sometimes. And now that I have, and I do, I know for sure that painting the rest of the army probably won't feel like a chore. Sometimes it just takes one model to really open your mind up to an entire army. Getting into each piece and spending time on it can give you insight into how it was designed and why something looks the way it does and how easy or difficult it will be to paint a lot of it. The best part for me is how this model really tells a story from top to bottom. Not even including the non-transformed version, this model has just enough details on it and a very cool base that you really get what's going on. And I love to see that when I paint models. It draws you in and it just begs you to ask more questions, to look into the lore and the rest of the army to really get into it and not just have it in your collection like so many other models. And that makes this version of Marathi in particular really worth it. Thank you again for joining me on another miniature rescue. If you like something about this video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe as it really helps out the channel. Once again, I'm Casey and I will see you in the next video. And of course, here are the final shots of Marathi. Thanks again.